party to speak to you today, but it's not because of the position that I serve in as a senior pastor of this church. It's because I prayed for you. Some of you, I prayed for you before you were born. God is my witness, that's true. Because for five years, all we had was this stage and this cement floor before we could build here. And I came out several hundred times knowing that God wanted us to make the church bigger and build a Christian high school. And I prayed for the students that were to come. Because I said, God, you know who they are. Some of you weren't even born yet. Because that was, that was over 15 years ago. So I stand here today with confidence to talk to you and, and share with you the, the plans that God may have for your life because I know he did all the miracles and made this place because of you and because of what he's going to do in you. You were created for a purpose. I want to tell you something that will save you a lot of time and a lot of hassle in your life. The purpose of your life is to know Jesus Christ, to worship him, and to work with him. And unless you get that in place, you'll never be fulfilled in life. You can pursue, and you can, you can get money, and it'll feel good for a season, but just like everybody else, I know a lot of people who have big money, and it never truly makes you happy because you get there and think, is this it? Is this all there is? Real fulfillment, that emptiness in your heart, comes when you take Jesus Christ in, and you start to follow him with your whole life, and you start to get in to build his kingdom. Here's what it says in Ephesians 2.10. I'm talking about you making a difference in this world as God works in you and through you. The Bible says this, Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you. Think of that. God has prepared something already that he wants you to do. He knows what it is. Do you know what it is? I want you to take a look at this video in just a moment. It's a video that, that is about the seven mountains of influence. And I want you to see where do I fit in? Where's my place? What's my spot? We're going to talk about that today to do something for God in my life. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade, came up with these seven things that he felt the Lord spoke to him. Francis Schaeffer, who had Labrie College in Switzerland and was an author of, of many Christian books and was well known in 1975, he came up independently with the same seven things to influence a nation and to influence the world. And, and then Lauren Cunningham from YWAM in 1975, three guys independently wrote down seven things that they felt would, that, that God had given them to change nations. And a few months later, they all came together and laid it out and couldn't believe that it was the same seven things. I believe that it was prophetic. I believe that the Lord was showing us how to influence a nation, and I believe you're in one of these seven. Check out this video and find out where you belong. Watch. It was August 1975, and the Lord had given me that day a list of things that I had never thought about before. He said, this is the way to reach America and nations for God. In every city of the world, an unseen battle rages for dominion over God's creation and the souls of people. This battle is fought on seven strategic fronts, looming like mountains over the culture to shape and influence its destiny. Over the years, the church slowly retreated from its place of influence on these mountains, leaving a void now filled with darkness. When we lose our influence, we lose the culture, and when we lose the culture, we fail to advance the kingdom of God. And now, a generation stands in desperate need. It's time to fight for them and take back these mountains of influence. The mountain of government, where evil is either restrained or endorsed. The mountain of education, where truths or lies about God and his creation are taught. The mountain of media, where information is interpreted through the lens of good or evil. 
the mountain of arts and entertainment, where values and virtue are celebrated or distorted. The mountain of religion, where people worship God in spirit and truth or settle for a religious ritual. The mountain of family, where either the blessing or a curse is passed on to successive generations. And the one mountain they all depend on, the mountain that fuels and funds all the other mountains. The mountain of business, where people build for the glory of God or the glory of man, where resources are consecrated for the kingdom of God or captured for the powers of darkness. Those who lead this mountain control what influences our culture. The last 50 years, we've seen the most rapid moral decline in history. The culture we inherited from our forefathers is disintegrating before our eyes. What kind of world are we leaving for our children and grandchildren? As long as the business mountain is held by enemies of the gospel, funding for the other mountains will always be constrained, and any efforts to advance the kingdom of God will be hindered. Imagine God's people reclaiming their cities and government, in the arts and entertainment, in the media, in education, in the family, in religious influence, but only limited by their imagination and not by a lack of finances. It's possible, but first, we must take back the mountain of business. God's move to take this mountain back has already begun. Thousands and thousands of business leaders in every major city across the nation are filling arenas to learn from business leaders and hear the gospel of Christ. 90% of people working in the marketplace believe in God. 78% believe spirituality and business mix. 70% say that because of their faith, they find meaning and purpose in life. There are over 56 million Bible-believing Christians working in the marketplace. A vast army of God waiting to be truly engaged in the battle. Yet this strategic army and battlefront has largely been left ignored by the church. More than 90% of church members do not feel they are being equipped or trained by the church to apply biblical faith in their day-to-day -day life. The Business Mountain is so strategic because that is the place of influence. When you look at culture, so much of culture is defined by what happens in business. If we would use the wealth of the world to bless the world, and bless it not only to distribute to the needy that which they need. When you bring economy and economic benefit to a nation or a culture, uh, then you have influence in that culture. People, as they're transformed, who will transform all the spheres of society. It is time to reclaim the seven mountains and bring the life of God back into our culture. I hope to make you think in a way you never have about the church. Because we think of the church as a building, right, that we all come to and we're supposed to go to church. And I believe in the church. I'm a pastor and I'm trying to influence people to follow Jesus. But that's the church with the little C. The church with the big C is the church of Jesus Christ. And we, church is, is it's a verb. It's action-oriented. We're the church to the world. And I think we made a mistake in these last few decades by holing up in buildings called churches and not being people of influence in the mainstream outside the church. And I believe that this school and the students that have come out of the school, that are in the school and are going to come out of the school, are supposed to be in the mainstream, many of you, influencing this world to know Jesus Christ. I want to talk about these areas of influence, and I want you to think about today, God, what would you have me to do? Some of you have a dream. And already somebody's put, uh, put a, 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 the kibosh on it. They, they, they think it, you're just thinking too big and, and, and thinking too far out there and thinking you're a big deal. I'm here to tell you that God puts dreams in young people's hearts. I'm here to tell you that we need people to go outside the doors of the church and into the mainstream to influence society with the ways that were spoken of just here a moment ago. Let me speak of each of them to you today a little bit. Making a difference with arts and entertainment. What is that? What we mean by that is sports. That's arts and that's entertainment is what that is. Movies, music, 
TV. Now, though, I believe in the church, and I believe in worship, and I believe in preaching and all those things. Predominantly, I'm not going to talk about inside the church today. Because I think we kind of got that down. We know we're supposed to worship. We know that we're, 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 we're supposed to preach. We know, we know that we're supposed to do these things. And we need all those preachers and worship leaders to influence people. But I'm not going to talk to you about that today because I think we got that one down. I'm going to talk to you about going beyond the church and being the influence that God's called you to be. When it comes to arts and entertainment, who's the most creative force in the universe? I'll tell you who it is. It's God. Nobody should be better at creativity than the people of God, the children of God, and believers. Because we have an advantage that unbelievers don't have. They've been gifted by God, just like you have, just like we have. They have gifts. Every gift that a person has comes from the Lord to them. But they don't have the Holy Spirit to give them unique and creative ideas and power to influence like we do. Genesis 1.1 says that God created the heavens and the earth. Everything you see in this world was created by God. You say, well, not this building, because man created that. But God created man with the ability to build even this. In the Bible, we see arts and entertainment. And we see it in the mainstream or secular sense. David could really play the harp and could really sing and was a musician. As a matter of fact, he wrote a, a ton of songs called Psalms that are in the Bible. But did you know that when the king would have an evil spirit come upon him in 1 Samuel 16, that David would play the harp, and when he would sing his music, that it would settle that heart down of the king. And the king wasn't following God. And so we see music influencing outside the, the church or outside the people of God. And then sports. Did you know it's all through the New Testament, all through the Bible? I believe there are 14 references in the New Testament to sports. Here's one of them, 1 Corinthians 9, 26. So I do not run without a goal. I fight like a boxer who's hitting something, not just the air. So sports all through the Bible, and you can have influence in sports. Poetry, Song of Solomon, Shakespeare. I, I, what I want to talk about is reaching out into the mainstream society. Not the church, but taking the church, taking Jesus to mainstream. Did you know what used to happen? in our world. Shakespeare, you've heard of Shakespeare, right? Listen, listen to one of the quotes from his plays. God be praised that to believing souls gives light in the darkness, comfort in despair. Did you know that Shakespeare in his day, all those years ago, that all of his plays went into every mainstream spot in the cities, theaters in the city, just, just common right downtown, the, the everyday theater, Shakespeare was there. And, and there were 42 books of the Bible that were quoted in Shakespeare. And over 1,200 biblical references in Shakespeare's plays. And that used to be mainstream. I believe that the church made a mistake when we pulled out of the world. I believe that when we said music is out there is evil and all those things are wrong, that we made a mistake. That we're not supposed to live in the walls of church. That's like saying that, 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 that you know, the fish in the aquarium, uh, you, you know, this is the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to go out into the big ocean and influence the, the world. We can speak of Bible values and truth of God, and it can come through what we say and what we do in the mainstream as artists and entertainers and, and, and athletes. The FCA vision is this. You know what FCA is, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, to see the world impacted for Jesus Christ through the influence of coaches and athletes. I thank God for the coaches and, and, and the athletes that, that, that are here in this school. And, and I see lives being impacted because our coaches don't just talk about X's and O's and being good on the field or the court. Our coaches talk about the field of life and Jesus Christ and how to navigate life and how your life can be used. But I want you to think of people like Tim Tebow. Who, who has millions of followers on social media. Russell Wilson, who'll tweet out scriptures on a regular basis, the quarterback of the Seattle Seahawks, who's a follower of Jesus Christ. And I, I, I wonder if any of you have heard of a, per, a young lady named Tori Kelly. Just anybody know who Tori Kelly is? Okay. Tori Keller's, Kelly is a really strong believer. She loves Jesus Christ, and what I'm talking about here, she is on a mission to be an influence for Jesus Christ in this world. So when you see her on MTV, when you see her winning awards, when you see her singing, you need to pray for her. 
because she has a higher purpose than just being in the top 40 in America. Tori Kelly wants to be an influence for God, and you can hear it in her lyrics. They're not overtly Christian, but they're covertly Christian, and she's on a mission. As a matter of fact, one of the things she does when she goes into a city is she'll go to one of the larger churches in the city before or after the concert, and as they're singing worship, she'll just come out on the, on the stage, and they'll say, Tori Kelly, and she'll sing a worship song absolutely beautifully. And then she'll leave. And you know what she's saying? She just stays for one song. She's saying, pray for me. She's saying, I'm with you. She's saying, know that I'm one of you. Know that I'm on a mission and that I want to reach people for Jesus Christ. I want to tell you about some people in this school that are on a trek to possibly already make a difference. Some of you remember Wyatt Houston, who was a quarterback here. He's a tight end at Utah State right now. Did you know that seven tight ends have gone into the NFL out of Utah State, that it's an NFL machine for tight ends? Wyatt Houston, in his junior year, he's gotten better every year. And there's a chance that Wyatt Houston will go into the NFL. It's true. And I think you should pray for him. I have a daughter named Candace, Candace Russell. You can find her on iTunes, who right now is in the middle of making an album in Nashville. And the person that's engineering Candace's project is currently engineering Taylor Swift's album, her new album, Live in Australia. Absolutely truth. Doesn't mean Candace is going to make it. But I'm telling you, she's dancing around the pool, and Candace is on a mission. She wants to influence people for God. She wants to tweet scriptures on her socials, and she's coming out with a new album in about three, three months, and she's working with people who've written number one songs in several genres in the mainstream. She's been working hard for several years. I think of Ashley Wyatt, who also is one that the Lord could bring up to do great things for him. I think of these young people that were on the stage leading worship today. I'm telling you, catch a dream for what God is saying to you. And if it's inside the church, that's awesome. We need you. But I do not want you to buy into this baloney that, that has been going on in the church for years, that if you go outside the church to minister, that you're not doing anything for God. You can influence this culture for God through arts, entertainments, and athletics. And I want some of you to hold that dream in your heart if the Lord is saying that. Because I believe God would use you greatly. I believe the church of Jesus Christ can make a difference. You know, the, the, the mountain of religion. I believe that preachers <clears throat> can truly make a difference. That worship leaders can make a difference. And I believe some of you are going to have a call. Some of you are going to be able to stand up just like I'm standing up right now. And tell people how to reach out to this world. Tell them how to completely dedicate their lives and that the Lord wants to use them. I like this quote from Bill Hybels. As he talks about the church, there's nothing like the local church when it's working right. Its beauty is indescribable. Its power is breathtaking. Its potential is unlimited. It comforts the grieving and heals the broken in context of community. It builds bridges to seekers and offers truth to the confused. It provides resources for those in need and opens its arms to the forgotten, the downtrodden, the disillusioned. It breaks the chains of addictions frees the oppressed, and offers belonging to the marginalized of this world. Whatever the capacity for human suffering, the church has a greater capacity for healing and wholeness. Still today, the potential of the local church is almost more than I can grasp, Bill Hybel says. No other organization on earth is like the church. Nothing even comes close. Some of you will receive a calling. I did not want to be a preacher, but God called me to be a preacher. I ran from God in this whole preaching thing because I wanted to be a business person. But God called me and I answered the call and I'm so glad that I did because he had more in mind for me than I could ever imagine. Ephesians 4.11 talks about prophets and apostles and pastors and teachers and evangelists. And some of you are going to receive that call. And here's what I want to say to those of you, you already, some of you know you're going, to, you're going to go into the ministry. The scriptures say this, all scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, is inspired by God. And it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Now li listen to that. The scriptures are to teach us what is true and show us what's wrong in our lives. And with the scriptures, the scripture here says we're supposed to correct people who are wrong. We're supposed to teach them to do right. And here's what I want you to know if you're going into the ministry. There's two types of preachers and teachers. Those who preach to get people to believe the Bible and those who preach to water it down and make you believe it less. And so if you're going to go into the ministry... I'm saying to you, the reason we're investing in you here is we want you to be that kind of person 
that preaches the word so that people will believe it. God's going to call some of you into that realm. Third spot is government. Man, we're in the middle of it right now with Trump and Rubio and Cruz and all these guys going at it uh, on, on television. And, and then there's Clinton and Sanders. And, and I believe the soul of our nation could, is going to be affected by who we vote in uh, as, as our president. But we need people in civic government locally in the city. We need people in our state who make a difference when the votes come. I've had the privilege of traveling to Washington, D.C. and meeting several senators, the United States senators, and meeting with politicians who totally love Jesus and are making a big difference. Do you know I know a senator who travels to Muslim nations and goes in and meets them? And a U.S. senator, I can't tell you who it is, but a U.S. senator walks in and shakes the hands of Gaddafi before he died and other Muslim leaders, and this is how he greets them with his first greeting. I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. To share with you his love. Holy cow, nobody knows that's going on, but God knows it's going on. And, and, and God wants godly leaders to influence the nation. Have you heard the name Will, William Wilberforce from England many years ago? Did you know that he eliminated slavery with 69 initiatives that he piloted through uh, his nation in England? And it affected England and the world. Slavery was largely abolished even in America because of Wilberforce's efforts. When he came to Jesus at 26, though, he felt like he was supposed to go in the ministry and not be in politics. I'm telling you, some people want to be preachers who are supposed to be in politics because they, they say, I want to I be totally dedicated to Jesus, and the way I do that is to be a preacher. No, the way you do that is to follow God's direction and his will for your life. And I believe some of you will be called into politics. I believe there are people that are coming to here to this school from other nations that will go back and influence nations. I believe that there are people in these schools that can go back and tell people who Jesus Christ is when they don't know. And I, I'm crazy enough to believe that God has something amazing for your life. Fortunately, though, with Wilberforce, there was a guy named John Newton. Do you, anybody know that name? He's the... He's, He's the former slave trader who became a Christian and wrote Amazing Grace, the, the hymn. And he talked to Wilberforce, and he challenged a young man to stay where he was, that God could use him the most in politics, and he changed nations as, as a slavery was abolished by many of his political initiatives. Proverbs 14.34 says, Godliness makes a nation great. Are you called into politics? Are you called into government? Godliness makes a nation great. We need you. Another area that you might be called to, and there are many here who are, is the media. This is newspaper. This is TV news anchors. This is reality shows. Did you, I, I don't know if you saw the reality show Rich in Faith, but, but that's Richie Wilkerson Jr., and that's one of my pastor friend's kids. And they were in a reality show. As he's, he's a young pastor. They're, they're showing him reaching out with compassion to the, to the poor and in, in, in the cities of Florida. But it's not just these mediums like, like TV and newspaper. It's Twitter. It's Facebook. It's YouTube. It's blogs. These avenues that, that are open up. People say these things are evil. Well, all this can be used for evil. Your mouth can be used for evil or good. This is a mouthpiece. And some of you are going to, with the brilliance that God has given you and the leading of the Lord, reach out in these areas and make a difference. With just a click on a box and write and, and and posting your blog, you can, you can affect hundreds of thousands of people. God can use media for good, and he desires to. He's looking for people that will work for him. Proverbs 4.18 says, the ways of right living, people glow with light there. And the longer they live, the brighter they shine. I believe you can shine even on social media for God. Christ followers need to be people of influence. We have, at Horizon Community Church, a news reporter for Channel 12, Fox News. It's Kelsey Anderson is her name. She's a young lady that's doing an awesome job. We have a young lady that went to this church named Taylor Smith, who's writing for the Oregonian newspaper, and she's writing Christian perspectives. And here's what she said. This is Taylor Smith a few years ago before she got the call to write for the Oregonian. Taylor said, when I graduated from Indiana University in May 2012, I knew my journalism degree would serve me well. 
God's given me ability to articulate things well through spoken and the written word. After I returned from a three-month mission trip to the Czech Republic last summer, I could have spent hours pouring over applications for news organizations, but I felt God calling me to just start writing, even if I didn't have a news platform to do it from. About three months into my blogging and doing some freelance writing, I received a call from the Oregonian asking me if I'd like to be a features writer, which means to write features about unique and interesting people for the Oregonian. She said, I was stunned. This was a paper I had read since I was a little girl, and within a few weeks, I was writing on a regular basis for the Oregonian. Some of you are called to the media. I wanted to be a, a, a new, a, stay with us, guys. Hey, stay with me, okay? I wanted to be a, a news a sports anchor for television. I was going to George Fox and, and studying media and communications because I believe God needs people out there, but God called me to something else. We need you. We need you <clears throat> on the national news <clears throat> as an anchor, being people, being a person of influence. Because 90% of the media are, 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 are not Christian. And many of them have their hearts set against Christianity. We need you to be in there. We need people in the mainstream. So perhaps you could aspire to something you never thought of. And perhaps you could do it for the glory of God and an emphasis to show people his love. How do you do that? You're just faithful. You live your life right. You speak positively. And then every now and then you'll have a chance and an opportunity to show people what you're really about. Where, what, what really drives you. And you can influence people. And then this area, I'm just going to say it quickly, the area of family. Every one of us have an opportunity to influence there. Susanna Wesley that's the name from yesteryear, but she had two sons, Charles Wesley, that she raised. She had nine children. One of them became uh, one of the great hymn writers of his day, a musician. The other became one of the great preachers of England who started revival there and then came to America and brought revival. You can raise up godly kids. You can make an incredible difference in your family. And just to aspire to that, that one will probably change the nation more than anything else if we love our families and we start there. And keep that in your heart as you go forward and God gives you that spouse, that person he's calling you to. Make sure they love God and raise your kids to know God. Follow God with your heart and life. And then the area of education, it hits home here, doesn't it? Some of you are called to be teachers. Not only in private Christian schools, but in public schools. We need more Christian teachers in the public schools. Did you know Harvard started out as a Christian school, a Christian college? In 1636, it was established for this purpose, training and releasing society clergymen, that's preachers, releasing preachers and scholars with Puritan values, and that meant godly values. Yale was founded in 1701 by 10 congregational ministers. Princeton was formed in, in 1746 by Presbyterian ministers to train ministers, and its motto was, this was Princeton's motto, it's been lost now, under God's power she flourishes. Along the way, we've lost our moorings in our nation, haven't we? Now, Yale, really, it's really true that, that um, Yale and other universities that I've just spoken of won't even allow Christian clubs on their universities. They won't allow Christians to meet in a, in, in a way that they congregate and have rights like all the other clubs have. We need an infusion of Bible truth, and we need to bring Jesus back into the public square. And some would say, well, you can't, you have the separation of church and state. Well, that's, that's true that there's a law there. But did, did you know that students have rights and parents have rights? Did you know that students can make a difference in a Christian school or in a, or in a public school as well? Proverbs 16, 21 says, the wise are known for their understanding and pleasant words that are persuasive. I believe God can use you in education. Here's a story of a young man who got saved at a public school because of a Christian teacher. This young man is our worship leaders, uh, our, our worship director at Horizon, Tiffany Ordonez. This is her husband in high school. Listen to this story. Carlos says, my freshman year, I lived in Stockton, and I had been here just two years after moving from Panama. I attended Edison High School. 
After class one day, three of my friends and I stayed to talk with our earth science teacher, Mrs. Cortez, as we often did. But that day, Mrs. Cortez asked us a life question that changed us. Would you like to pray with me to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? My friends and I prayed that prayer that day. And for the next year, this teacher picked us up and took us to youth group every Wednesday night. And this is where I grew in my relationship in the Lord. To this day, Ms. Cortez is still mentoring her students and sharing the love of Christ with them the same way she did with me. I'm so thankful for the boldness of one teacher who was determined to make a difference. I thank God for these teachers, for these administrators, for, for the principals, vice principals that are here at the school. I thank God for all the teachers and administrators that are Christians in the public schools bringing light into those places where darkness flourishes too many times. God is raising up teachers, and it's, it's an amazing call to influence lives, and perhaps God's calling you to do that. And then the last one. I don't know if you noticed, but they took more time in the last one in the video, making a difference in the area of business. One of the things they said is something I don't think people think about very much. When we think of missions and we think of giving and generosity from people who are gathering wealth, we usually think of poor people. But I want, to, I want you to know that though God is for the poor, and he certainly wants those who have wealth to give to the poor, God wants to raise up some people to advance his kingdom in America as well. So some of these young artists who may not get all the support from the world because of their positive message that could bring people uh, in, into an understanding that God created and that God is pursuing them with love, they may not get the support of the world. But the support of these people who gather wealth and make hundreds of millions of dollars can come alongside them and make a huge difference when it couldn't be made another way. Business can fund all the other areas of influence that I've talked about today. As a matter of fact, because of some great Christian businessmen, millions of dollars was given to build these buildings. It, millions was given by this church by people who weren't wealthy. And millions was given by people beyond this church who are Christian businessmen to make it happen. Because they have a priority in their life, and it's to build the kingdom of God. I met with one of them who gave millions to this place recently. And you know what he said? He mentioned how many millions he had to give away. And he said, I want to give it all away before I die because I can't take it with me. So rather than put it in some fun, I'm just dispersing it every place that I can now to make a difference to build God's kingdom. There was a senior advisor for Continental Airlines named David Grizzle. Now, now we're talking big business, Continental Airlines. He received a significant bonus, but he decided to donate it to charity. And just because he had that generous heart to donate it, and, and in his sense it was a Christian charity, somehow that caught the attention of all the other employees, and it inspired several other executives to follow suit. And because he started giving to charity with his gift, $7 million came in that year for charity because that guy led the way and others followed. You ever heard of Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A? We almost got one in Tualatin, but they stopped it from going in uh, down there by Cabela's. Uh, I think they stopped it because they have Christian moorings in, their, in, 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 the, in the leadership, just honest. I had some people from the city tell me who, who would know. And Truett Cathy has given uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to the body of Christ to build the kingdom of God. He started in 1946, and now he has a, a billion-dollar business and restaurant chain. They give college scholarships and character-building programs and elementary children programs and foster homes and churches and all kinds of philanthropic causes. David Green, who, who owns Hobby Lobby, has given over $300 million for, for the cause of Jesus Christ being made known in this world. And if you're sitting here today thinking, well, yeah, like these high schoolers can really make a difference, let me tell you a story. I know a man, and I've worked with him, and he's given to, to unbelievable, unbelievably advance the cause of Jesus Christ, who as a junior higher, hey, guys, wake those two guys up right there. Wake them up. Yeah, just bump him. Hey, buddy, welcome back. All right, here we are. Uh, I want you to hear this, man. This could, this could change your life. This, this, this guy is a junior hire at a camp, felt at an altar that God spoke to him and said, I'm going to make you a rich man, and I want you to build my kingdom. I want your resources to go to my cause around the world. 
to show my son Jesus Christ. That guy became a very wealthy man. And that guy today is giving millions for the cause of Christ. God could speak to you today. And it could make a difference in the future. What I'm trying to do is, you've maybe never heard a sermon exactly like this, where someone's saying, think beyond the boundaries. Think beyond the church with the little C to the church with the big C. Think about the possibilities of what God could do. And I have a question for you. Why not you? Why not you? I want it to be you. God wants it to be you. You love him. You have a heart for him. He's given you talent. God wants to use your life to advance the cause of Jesus Christ. I want you to bow your heads, and we're going to pray. Father, your word says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not men. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand if you feel called to any of these spots that we talked about today, any of these places of influence. I just want every head bowed, every eye closed, because we just want some privacy right now. Because some of you are a little bit afraid to even share the dream. It's so big in your heart, you think, people just think I, I have aspiration. But God cares for you. So every head bowed, every eye closed, please, if you'd do that, I'd appreciate it. If you feel that God wants to use you in the area of arts, sports, or entertainment, I want you to lift your hand. No one looking around. Just lift, lift it up high. Okay. There's a number of you. That can be coaches, and, and, and that can be artists, that can be painters, that, that can be graphic arts, that can be music, and all these things we talked about today. There's many of you there. <clears throat> How about those who feel called now to be a part of the church or even parachurch ministry, but you're working in ministry as a pastor or a Christian worker to advance the cause of Jesus Christ. This is worship leaders. This is pastors. This is leaders of organizations that are reaching to the poor. I want you to lift your hand if you feel called to church or parachurch. Can you do that? Just lift your hand if there's anyone here today. Okay? How about those that would say, you know what? I thought about government. I thought about politics. Perhaps the Lord would use me. I have a heart for that. Lift your hand if you think, you know, I think government or politics is where I might go. God's looking for some godly people like you. Okay, I see that hand. Are there others? Lift your hand if you think, God, use me there. I have a heart for it. Use me. How about the media? Maybe you think, I I, I could be used by God with social media, uh, in news or or newspaper or otherwise, to write, perhaps just a writer of of books. Is that you? Would you lift your hand? You feel, I think I might be called to to the area of media. Okay. God bless you. How about those that would say, you know what, I just want to get it right with family, man. Perhaps your family didn't get it right. Perhaps your family did. It's made a big difference in your life. But you want to be a mom, a dad who's there. You want to be a person who shows the way of how how to love God and how to love family. And if you have that heart for family, just can you just raise your hand and say, I want to do it right, God. Use me to bless my family. It's a family that's coming, but Lord, I want to bless them. Lift your hand now if that's you. Okay? All right, many of you. How about the, those that would say, I, I feel that I'm supposed to be a teacher. Maybe you don't know if it's a Christian school or a public school, but it's, it's a place of influence where God would use you. If, you want, if you feel called to be a teacher, just lift your hand. Would you do that? Can you do it? Okay. There's a hand there. Any others? Teachers? Okay. God bless you. How about the, those that would say, I feel called to be a business person, a businesswoman, a businessman. I want you to lift your hands. A person of influence in the realm of business. Could you lift your hand? Okay. All right. There's a number of you today. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to ask you to do something. Would you stand, please, and reach across the aisle with your hands? Let's just join hands across the aisle. And I want to pray for you. Can we do that? Yeah, just stretch, stretch out, cross over the aisles. Join hands with one another if you do that. Telling you, I prayed for you years ago. I didn't know who you were, but I'm praying for the students that the Lord was going to send. And I believe He raised up the school because He loves you, but it was bigger than that. He raised up the school because He wanted to raise up some people and change nations. And we believe that God's going to use your life. We're investing in you. Your parents are investing in you. We believe these teachers are investing in you. 
that you can influence this world. Would you pray about what God may put on your heart today as I pray? Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you touch hearts today. Lord, if there's one, if there's two, if there's ten, if there's twenty, if there's fifty that will totally dedicate themselves completely to you and your work, would you lead them? And God, I pray for the dreamers today, the dreamers who are just a little too afraid to tell people what's going on in their heart. Maybe they've been bold like Joseph about some things you put in their heart people didn't understand. But God, I pray that the dream would stay alive. I pray that the seed of your word today would just nurture the dream that you put in their hearts. We pray for world changers that come from horizon. We pray for, for world changers, Lord, that would make a difference in the area of arts, entertainment, music, business, the church, media, education, and government. Use these lives, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Before you're seated, turn to someone and say, I believe in you, man. All right? You can be seated. Amen. <laughs>